have to fight again, it'll be to take these steps. As we stand against the war, we also stand behind those who resist it. More and more U.S. service members are actively refusing to participate in the illegal, immoral invasion and occupation of Iraq. No more. We have a different path to take, and it doesn't matter what they do to us. It doesn't matter if they, if they take away our, um, our honorable discharge, if they put us in prison. Call it peace or call it treason, call it love or call it reason, but I ain't marching anymore. I firmly believe that, you know, uh, we, we hold um, first-hand accounts of what's happened, so there's a, a level of credibility there uh, that I think is in direct contradiction to, you know, what some of the people who normally speak about the war uh, say, which is elected officials and, you know, pundits. Uh, so we bring that kind of credibility to, to, to the war. To this. What are the kinds of, like, projects that the IBW is working on and that people can get involved in? Uh, one of them is truth and recruiting, and saying that uh, basically informing um, teenagers about their their rights. Uh, we want the we want it to be a truthful recruiting process. We don't do counter recruitment, and you know you could kind of say that's what it is. But we we want recruiters to tell the truth. We don't know kids. We don't let kids know what exactly they're getting into. Uh, that's one of the campaigns, and we're always interacting, uh, working on to uh, end the war. Um, back in March, we held Winter Soldier. Uh, which is the 13th through the 16th, and from Winter Soldier, it was uh, you know Iraqi uh, or vets from Iraq, Iraq and Afghanistan giving a first-hand testimony about uh, atrocities that they had seen in Iraq, and um, from there they went did Winter Soldier on the Hill, and it was seen before you know Congress people. So the next step is logically to, is to get that under oath. Um, so actively trying to end the war, actively uh, encouraging GIs to resist. Uh, so there there's lots of uh, GI resistance campaigns. Excellent. Yeah. And, um, what, what, is the, what is the best way do you think to end the war? What are we doing to end I think people need to get out in the streets. I mean, I, I think it has to be a real movement. I don't think it, it, one thing is going to end the war. Uh, as we saw in 2006, you know, politicians are not going to end the war. And if you look at the trajectory and you look at, um, you know, just look at that embassy that was built. You know, it's the largest embassy in the world. Uh, Obama, the anti-war candidate, says, he, you know, he's going to leave 50,000 troops. They have to protect the embassy. You need at least 10,000 uh, soldiers to protect that at all times. So you have to question, you know, why, why we're really there. And so uh, I don't think uh, it's going to happen from politicians. It can't happen just by, you know, uh, I don't know, people lobbying uh, to, to end the war. That's that's not the answer. Uh, GIs have to stop fighting the war. That's that's how it that's how it ends. And they need the support. They need to see people in the streets that are supporting them, so that you know when they actually resist and when they go AWOL, that the people are there for them. We just want to tell what our three points of unity are, and that is to, uh, to uh, immediate withdrawal of all occupying forces from Iraq, uh, make reparations to the Iraqi people for the destruction that we've caused in their country, and also to have full benefits, uh, mental and physical, for all veterans returning overseas without questions, no appeals. Do you have any opinions about the war in Afghanistan? I'm starting to think that that's a big scam as well. If you start to look at their, uh, at what kind of oil pipeline is going on, there's a lot of behind the scenes things. Veterans! My experience was is that I was a welder and I armor plated, uh, I, not by myself, but with a good team of welders and a good support, uh, good uh, other good soldiers that I worked with. And I'm very proud that, of the work that we did. And we armor plated uh, many, many vehicles and we saved a lot of soldiers' lives. Um, but I was, uh, kind of, it was, the war was kind of questionable. When I got back, I really researched what was going on, and I found that, uh, and I found that uh, it just seemed like there were a lot of lies and uh, uh, a lot of obscurities. So that's why I'm questioning it now. Yes, I'm out here today, continuing to fulfill my oath as a Marine. I'm here for those who wish they could stand here with us. We're uh, marching today to the convention center to deliver a letter to the Democratic National Convention asking that they stop 
continuing to fund the occupation of Iraq. Can you tell me a little bit about what, about your experience in Iraq and how it led you to be a, a member of Iraq Veterans Against the War? Yes, and the continued war on terror, as it's called, the Iraqi people will do what the American people would do under occupation. They will resist occupation ad infinitum. If we have truly afforded them freedom and democracy, then it's time to do what the Iraqi people ask and leave their country. I'm here today, to, like the rest of us, I guess, to send a message to uh, Senator Obama uh, that we want to end this war and we want to hold the Democrats and, and him accountable if he is the Democratic nominee uh, for what they say they want to do, which is end the Iraq war. Yeah, could you tell me um, what it was about your experience in Iraq that led you to turn against the war? Um, it was uh, not being able to do really anything that I thought was good there. Um, all I really did was drive around the country, uh, you know, using up fuel and uh, delivering uh, supplies, military supplies, along with food and water for soldiers, um, which is not a bad thing in and of itself, but I, I would have also liked to have been delivering supplies to Iraqis that needed them very badly. I was told not, not to even throw an MRE off out of my truck to Iraqis because uh, the reasoning was the reasoning was we didn't want to uh, hurt anybody you know, with our trucks. <clears throat> but um, I have a feeling it was not not the real reason. They weren't concerned about Iraqi children's safety. They just didn't want to give away anything. How do you think the Iraqi people feel about our troops being there? Uh, I'm pretty sure they're extremely tired of it by now. Um, if they're still alive, I mean, I, uh, estimates say that there's over a million or half half a million dead, I believe. Some of the estimates, uh, uh, refugees, well over a million. And so I'm sure unless they're <clears throat> unless they're part of this um, government that's, uh, in my mind, sort of a puppet government, um, then they're and they're and they're not happy at all. GDLS, uh, General Dynamics Land Systems, uh, you know, makes makes money off of every striker that uh, that gets destroyed. We could see that, uh, you know, every, every time we, you know, uh, an IED uh, even superficially hurt a striker, you know, the the military has to buy more parts for those strikers, and it's so it's so blatant over there. You know, the, everything in the on the the FOB, the forward operating base, is property of Kellogg Brown and Rutt. On it, and uh, you know, it's it's just uh, th there's no there's no veil of uh, legitimacy over there. It's it's quite obvious that to everyone that's there that there's people who are making amazing amounts of money on this war, and uh, that that's what it's all about. I joined the army knowing that we were going to go to war with Iraq. It was pretty obvious at that point. But I was against the war, and uh, you know I was open about those views all throughout the time I was in the military. There were definitely a lot more people questioning why we're we're in Iraq, and a lot more people you know started coming around and realizing that oh you know this you know, this is this is a symptom of a much larger problem. You know this this paternalist government that we we live under is you know that this war is is just a symptom of that. I was a sergeant in the United States okay. Army. I got to Iraq in 2004. My second day in combat, I was put in the turret of an up-armored Humvee and given a machine gun and told to protect my team. And as I stand here today and look at all of you, if you were in Iraq, I would have pointed weapons at you too. And there's nothing more that I would love to do than go back to Iraq and tell those families that I pointed my machine gun and my rifle and my pistol at that I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I'm the nightmare for their children. I'm sorry that I've read hate for my country. And I wish nothing more for them to know that I love them and I'm sorry.
I'm uh, Harvey Tharp. I was in the uh, Navy and I was the uh, projects officer for uh, Kirkuk, Iraq from uh, October of 03 to March of 04. I, uh, I was responsible for um, the uh, reconstruction of um, the entire pro province of uh, Kirkuk and uh, um, setting up the uh, municipal contracting for all the uh, the uh, reconstruction efforts that were, that were going on by the coalition in, in the city of Kirkuk. I was an Air Force uh, linguist, Arabic linguist before the uh, before the Navy, um, and uh, in the Air Force Reserves during law school. I joined in uh, 2000 after I got a lot out, of, out of law school. I was I was a, I was a uh, judge advocate. They they were grabbing at anybody who had ever studied Arabic before, so they raided the Navy Staff Corps. So I went over to Iraq with a, um, a, a Navy, radio, Navy uh, radiologist, a uh, supply officer, a uh, dentist, a uh, doctor, and a um, uh, base executive officer. They sent us out to the to six different provinces of, of Iraq, and we sort of filled in for the um, for the uh, jobs like projects officer, political advisor, and uh, other jobs that, that weren't being filled because they didn't have. Uh, didn't have the um, they didn't have the plans to uh, to fill these kind of jobs and they didn't have the uh, resources to do them. So our jobs were supposed to be done by civilians, but they from the State Department or from U.S. Aid for uh, Agency for International Development, the professionals in project recon reconstruction and uh, diplomacy and everything else. But the reason they couldn't send them was they could they didn't have. Um, uh, armor-plated, bulletproof uh, uh, vehicles. They didn't have security teams. They didn't, they didn't have um, uh, secure communications or anything like that. But when we when we arrived, they realized they we were military, so they could afford to order us to to go into these uh, really uh, dangerous areas of Iraq and and do do these do these jobs. So. When I was in Kirkuk, I was driving around with one other, one other, other guy in a plain white SUV with uh, just my pistol and no radio. And I had to buy my own uh, um, um, body armor from BulletproofMe.com for $800. Um, and I, I did that for the entire six months. I never, you know, we never did have a radio, never did have body armor from, from the military. To someone considering joining the military now, I would say that um, I've been, I was in the military for a total of 12 years and it was very good to me, but, but it's a totally different situation now. And it's, um, it's, it's not, you know, going to Iraq for multiple tours and uh, getting PTSD. I've, I've had very mild symptoms of PTSD and I wouldn't wish it on anyone. And um, to having the the severe kinds of PTSD that will that will haunt you for years and years, and and having to deal with with what you what what you'll what you'll see and what you'll have to do if you go to Iraq is 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 something I wouldn't I wouldn't wish on anyone. I was there six months and I uh, volunteered to stay, but uh, the Navy wanted me to transfer to. Uh, from the from being a judge advocate to uh, naval intelligence, they had too many judge judge advocates, and they needed in, intel officers. And with my experience in Iraq and and some knowledge of Arabic, they they wanted me for signals intelligence. Over there, the first time, I I didn't give a thought to refusing to go in at, at all, and it it would have seemed to me like moral phys, physical cowardice for me to to refuse to go when when I was called upon to go the first time, but. But once I went there and, and, and risked my life every day going outside the wire, um, outside the base and, you know, in this, you know, a crazy situation in, in a plain white SUV with no radio and everything else, um, once I had done that and proved that I had the physical courage, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't feel like I needed to prove anything to anyone anymore. And so um, it, it became a question of moral courage to me once I realized that the war was wrong, did I have the moral courage to stand up and say I won't be part of it anymore. I actually joined Iraq Veterans Against the War the summer after I got out of, this, in the summer of 2004, only, only a few months after I uh, returned from Iraq. I was one of the first, I was probably the first active duty officer to join Iraq Veterans Against the War. It was a long process and, and some of it was, was um, you know, not finding weapons of mass destruction, all the reasons for our being there turning out to be false. Um, um, 
the, the, the fact that our presence there didn't seem to be benefiting the Iraqi people at all, the fact that we seemed to be there for the oil and, then, and not for anything else. And so he told my commanding officer that I couldn't voluntarily participate in the war in Iraq anymore. And his response was that you're not the only one who's had doubts about the Iraq war. Um, and you're going to have to make a decision because I, I'm, as it stands right now, I'm going to order you to go into National Security Agency and do your job and very likely deploy to Iraq and, and as a signals intelligence officer and be a part of the combatant mission in Iraq. Um, and your only option is to resign your commission. Did the decent thing, gave the option of resigning. You have a conscience and you have to follow it. I am Sergeant Matthew Chereau. Individual Ready Reserve U.S. Army. June 15th of this year, I refused to deploy to Iraq. Yeah. 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 The occupation of Iraq is illegal, unconstitutional, and is a war of aggression as defined by the Geneva Conventions, the Nuremberg Principles, and the U.N. Charter, which was violated when we invaded inherently violating Article 6, Section 2 of our U.S. Constitution. This is unacceptable as I am sworn to protect and defend my Constitution from all enemies foreign and domestic. Our enemies are at home, ladies and gentlemen. They are here. They will kill this country with apathy, with selfishness, with greed, with materialism. We stand here in defense of the Constitution. We stand here in defense of the rule of law. We stand here in defense of our brothers and sisters who have had their services abused so deeply by the highest leaders in this land. This is unacceptable. Not by my hands will I provide. Not by my hands will I take another's life who never did anything to this country in the first place. In 2006, 90% of U.S. soldiers and service members in Iraq believe that the war was the result of Saddam Hussein's involvement in September 11, 2001. We know this to be false. We need to take this message to the service member and make them understand this war is a fraud of American military might. Let us never, let us never stand by in apathy while well, our rights are stripped and lives are taken overseas. Thank you. I ain't marching anymore. I joined up when I was 17. Um, I don't know if, you know, for some reason I, I thought that killing people was going to be cool. You know, I don't know why I, I thought that way at the time, but that's the way I did, and my recruiter definitely, I think, uh, capitalized on that. It was a lot like most people. Um, after September 11th, uh, I felt like I needed to do something to, uh, you know, protect my country. Um, I, I, I bought into the, uh, the whole... Um, the whole propaganda you know, of uh, the reason that we were going over there was to fight for freedom and democracy, and you know they they they, they use those words over and over and over again: freedom, freedom and democracy. And uh, you know, the whole concept of uh, achieving peace through war, I believe that, and um, I think that before I joined, um, maybe my. Uh, concept of what I, I thought war was, you know, I, 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 the, I've seen war before, um, before I joined the military, my, my, my idea of war was based on war movies um, and video games pretty much, you know, you know what I mean. Um, when I got over there, I saw war for what it really was, and it's just, it's not something I want to do anymore. We had like 25 guys in my battalion that died, so. Just so you, you know, that's all you see around you is death and destruction. I didn't see any um, creation going on. I didn't see any democracy. All I saw was war and death. 
But you know, we were supposed to be over there um, helping him out, and I mean, from what I saw, there wasn't really much helping out going on. I mean, we we weren't out there fixing their their plumbing, you know, giving them food and water and electricity. We were, you know, going house to house, uh, waking up little kids in the night, scaring the hell out of them, and uh, scaring scaring families. And, you know, I saw a lot of uh, just people that literally got off on killing. Um, and they got away with it, you know. They shoot first and ask questions later, basically. You know, there was this one time the, a vehicle pulled up to a, our checkpoint that was on our base, and um, I guess the driver probably couldn't read. Most of them are uh, illiterate and uh, didn't follow the signs correctly. Um, so they just opened fire on the vehicle and killed. There was a father and uh, his son was in the vehicle. And, you know, just ripped them apart. Um, and didn't get any news coverage whatsoever. It was swept under the, under the carpet like it never happened. There was a lot of stuff like that. I uh, remember another particular event. Um, someone was walking down the road after curfew, which, you know, they're not supposed to be doing. Um, they said that he had like a bag or something um, with him. So it ended up being a bag of fruit, but they shot him and, you know, they, they stuck his body in the back of the truck and brought it back on base and they were, uh, the, the, the soldiers that did this and the one that shot him were like really proud, really, uh, they thought it was the coolest thing you know, showing off his body, and you know, look what I did. Uh, that that particular event right there was when I realized that this isn't right. Yeah. Any dumb f can kill. Go to go to school and learn how to maybe save lives and learn how to contribute something good to humanity instead of uh, destruction. Anyone can kill. You don't have to be smart to shoot a gun. Iraq Vets Against the War is a group of veterans that have served since 9-11 uh, in the War on Terror. And uh, we stand for three things. Uh, immediate withdrawal of all U.S. occupying forces from Iraq. Uh, reparations for the Iraqi people. And uh, full benefits for all veterans. And the reason I have the flag upside down on my shoulder is because it's a symbol of distress because I am very distressed. My friends are being stop lost and sent back to Iraq without their consent. Uh, the myth of the volunteer army is very distressing to me because it's not a volunteer army. Uh, we've been enslaving soldiers for six years now under the pretext of a national emergency which is non-existent. Blackwater, Aegis, Titan, they're all mercenaries and I have nothing good to say about those assholes. They're uh, scamming the government. They make 15 times more than a normal soldier does, and they have no honor. And uh, I would like nothing more than to see the collapse of those organizations. Only one-fifth of the incidents that go on are reported. So, uh, and that's on a good day. So these guys, they, they are free from the law. Uh, I used to listen to them in the DFAC on Camp Taji, going on and on about, oh, we wasted this guy and, uh, oh, did you report it? No, why? Why would we do that? Um, I mean, they're the scum of the earth. I think the main thing for Iraq vets is to act because we've been enslaved for so long. We've been forced to do this. This Years of our lives have been given away to a war that's immoral and illegal, and we need to find a way to make that better in ourselves. While you were in Iraq, did you see any resistance to the war among the troops? Oh, absolutely. I, I had to tell you a story. Okay, when I was in Iraq. When I was in Iraq, I had a friend. He told me that on Camp Cuervo in 2004, that it was too dangerous to go out during the, the Shiite militia uprisings. And he said that the company level commanders and the first sergeants 
the captains and the first sergeants started uh, telling their guys it was okay not to go outside the wire, not to do missions. Well, the brigade commander found out about it and instituted this policy of, well, I'm going to check the mileage on the Humvees to see if they actually went out this week. And he went around with the clipboard every Monday, every Humvee in his brigade, he checked the mileage. And of course, the first unit that got caught got yelled at, somebody got in trouble. And uh, what was the response? These, these first sergeants and company commanders started organizing details to drive around the base in circles. And if that's not an act of GI resistance, I don't know what is. When I was in Bellingham, after I got out of the Army, uh, I had a nightmare and I woke up and I started thinking about some things. And these dreams kind of led me to uh, a therapeutic type action. For me, it was to get up on a tower in downtown Bellingham, Washington, in front of the federal building, which is a symbol of all the power structure of this country that leads us into war without thinking of the real effects of it. And uh, I decided to protest the stop loss policy because it's the most immoral of all of the policies in our country right now. You're sending the guys back who have already been there two, three times, whose contracts are up. You're breaking their contracts. It's actually illegal, come to find out, when I start researching it. It's illegal. It has not been sanctioned by the federal court system. So I started protesting it and started realizing that it was a really powerful issue because the establishment can't say, you can't justify it except for the fact that they don't want to have a draft because uh, there's too many people that are opposed to an illegal and moral war. So uh, it's kind of the last little thing that's holding the army together. And the army is at the breaking point right now. As far one and two of my friends going back to Iraq for OIF 0709 is stop lost. More than half of my company is stop lost. So I protested that in Bellingham for eight days and seven nights on a on a scaffold that I made into a guard tower, and then I did it again in D.C. and I founded the National. Stop the Stop Loss Campaign.